Hi. The last time I was talking more about the void space or the gap of disconnect, it's the same thing. I'm going to continue to explain what I mean by this and the flow of emotions because to me when we're in the state of being in which we can allow ourselves to just feel freely or even connect to the emotional self, the emotional layer, which is there, that's when we stop acting from the void space. That's when we stop connecting from the void space and we start connecting more authentically from our truth. Again, this is just my opinion. This is what I believe. But ever since I've started doing this process, it's completely changed my life because I realized that my whole life I wasn't really feeling feelings. I was reacting, which is why I also made the other video about reacting versus mindfulness. This process that I'm talking about, the flow of emotions, it's not about reacting to something that somebody said or something that happened in our environment that made us feel some kind of a way. Therefore, we started doing something in return. That's not what I'm talking about as far as the flow of emotions. It's how do I feel? What is this making me feel? And then letting go and allowing the feelings to just cycle through. And it's very hard to do that. We think we're doing that when we're angry, for example, or frustrated, or these things that we start to feel that are so extreme. It's like, what do you mean? I am feeling something. I'm super pissed off. Yeah, but I'm guessing it's because somebody said something or something happened that pissed you off. Or if you woke up just pissed off, I guarantee it's because you're not happy with your life or just how things are going. It's always because of something. That's not mindfulness. That's just a reaction. That's because something happened and now I'm feeling some kind of a way, which is on the surface. It's still valid. We all have that, but that's something that we all get in touch with, with no effort. Mindfulness, getting into the flow of emotions takes a lot of effort and time and space within ourselves for us to continue to connect and to really explore how we're feeling and just different things that are going on, different things that have happened that have affected me and how have I taken that into adulthood? Because we have so many layers to us and the brain self-protects by nature, that's normal. So all the experiences in childhood in which we weren't really allowed to feel freely because we didn't necessarily know what that meant, we started putting up the wall or we started to disconnect a little bit, or we started coming up with a gimmick. Look, I'm gonna make everybody laugh so that people are gonna like me. Look, I'm gonna draw this cool picture so that people are gonna like me. It's like, I'm gonna go and be very entertaining, or I'm gonna go and get really good grades, or I'm gonna go and continue to do things to try to get people to like me, or so, so that people see me in a positive way. And kids are constantly doing that. And I think we just do that by nature, which is why this process to me is always necessary because even if we had a pretty decent childhood, we still have a void space because until we go in and learn how to fill that in ourselves, all we're doing is learning how to get other people in other situations to continue to fill it because it feels good. It's like, well, look at me. I'm, I'm making people laugh. That feels good. Well, look, I have a lot of friends. That feels good. I'm getting good grades. That feels good. And I'm about to go to prom with this person that I really like. That feels good. I'm about to graduate. That definitely feels good. And I'm going to go to college. That feels good. I have this nice job now. And, you know, all these things that we start doing, which is totally fine. But those are all just processes of life in general. That's just part of what we start doing as humans to just continue on. But that's not mindful feelings. That's not getting into any type of flow of the emotional self. So what happens is a lot of times we just start to stay on the surface. And a lot of people are totally fine with that. I'm not. I didn't even realize how much I wasn't feeling anything because I always felt so anxious or stressed out or depressed. I always share my story with you guys because I understand. I understand feeling 
the anxiety, for example, and it doesn't feel good, but that's still not emotion. That's not the mindful emotions that I'm talking about. And we need to recognize different things that have happened in our past and how that has affected us. Because if we don't, we're just going to keep the wall up and we're going to keep running from ourselves and running from even good things in our life. So for me, um, I'm really good at self-sabotaging because I don't always know how to accept or welcome positive things. Why? Because I wasn't seeing myself in a positive way. So I don't think that I deserve that on some level. Behavior implications. Do I know this when I'm self-sabotaging and pushing people away and not going for better in my life? No. I just rationalize it and make excuses. Well, I don't want to work there. I don't want to do this. Or oh, this person irritates me. I don't like him anyway. So whatever. And we'll do whatever we can to try to not bring it back to ourselves and put it back on somebody else and make it somebody else's issue or it's because of something else and we don't ever hold ourselves accountable for act for how we're actually feeling about ourselves so this process is really difficult because i've had to really look at a lot of things that i've done a lot of things that have been done to me and it doesn't feel good but what feels good now is knowing that I can go in and start to feel whatever I need to feel. And yes, it's very scary sometimes. It's not pleasant. But you know what I'm in control of in a healthy way is whether I'm going to feel that or not. Whether I'm going to choose to feel that or not. It's a choice. You can either choose to feel or you can choose to run. It's always going to be your choice. And when we run... It doesn't always look like running in a bad way. It looks like, hey, I'm going to go out and party or, hey, I'm going to go out and people please. Hey, I'm going to go out and have some drinks or, hey, I'm going to, you know, smoke some weed today. I'm just going to watch my favorite show for 10 hours in a row on Netflix or whatever. And we don't think of that as running. We just think of that as something fun. But a lot of times that can be us running. And it doesn't mean that you can't watch TV or go have a drink or go have a good time. It's just that we learn to do those things so naturally to completely avoid ourselves and things that have happened and things that start to feel uncomfortable and unpleasant. And so the problem with that now is if I'm running for myself constantly, self-sabotaging, just ruining everything good in my life, not only am I going to not be able to connect to people in a healthy way or even have a healthy, happy relationship because I'm pushing everything away, it's now that I'm disconnected within myself and I'm kind of choosing to stay in the void space and I'm continuing to make decisions from the void space, that's gonna look like me not ever getting better for myself. How am I gonna continue to grow? And how can I have good things in life and continue to cultivate even good relationships with multiple people if I'm constantly running for myself? I can't. And I know some people are thinking, yeah, well, I'm fine. I have one good friend or I have my spouse, my wife or husband, for example. A lot of people do. That doesn't mean they're happy. That doesn't even mean they're happy with who they're with. <laughs> A lot of times we have our one go-to person. I know I always did. Even if it was a friend, something that makes us feel safe. This person knows me. I don't really have to put on an act. So I can continue to connect to them from the void space because that's all I can give them because that's all I'm giving myself. And it just kind of works because we don't go any deeper and we keep everything on the surface and everything's fine and I feel safe, I'm comfortable, I'm good. I don't want anything else. Don't peel away any layers. I just, I'm good. Stay away. I'm keeping myself at a distance from everything, but not realizing it technically. So we can be close to one or two people, but that doesn't mean that we're actually close with them in a real way that we're still probably connecting through the void space 
it's I can be around somebody every single day and never be vulnerable with that person. I can live with somebody and never be vulnerable with that person. That's something we have to choose to do. So again, this process takes a lot of mindfulness because it's what are you willing to do for yourself? What are you willing to hold yourself accountable for? And how far do you want to take it? Because feeling the shame, feeling unworthy, feeling not good enough, feeling like I'm defective sometimes, feeling invisible, that never feels good. And so I'm, instead of feeling that, what am I going to do? I'm probably going to start running. So I'm going to do all these different things to continue to try to avoid myself. And as I'm doing all these things, I'm keeping myself in the void space. That's what I was explaining last time. So I want to get a little more into that again. I want to give you another scenario. I'd, I like to give you guys scenarios so you can just kind of see it playing out. It's not something that may pertain to you at all, but I just want you to understand how we start seeing ourselves and what that can start to look like even in our adult lives. So pretend like I'm, I have a 13 year old son. I'm a single mother, I have a 13 year old son, and dad's around kinda sometimes. Let's just imagine this scenario. So here I am and you know, I actually deal with depression and I've never dealt with my issues, so I'm not connected to myself, so I'm still in my void space. And my void space looks like creating a lot of drama in my life. It looks like talking shit about everybody and just always seeing everybody in such a negative way, gossiping, however you want to see it, it's all the same thing. <laughs> and I like to drink all the time. Not only that, let's take it a step further. When I drink and go out and party, I actually take my son with me. And sometimes I get so drunk that I even allow him to start drinking a little bit. As long as you're in front of me, it's okay, you can drink, that's fine. Because I'm here to supervise you even though I'm super drunk. So now over and over and over again, this relationship dynamic, it's I'm the mom and how am I cultivating a relationship with my son? I'm not, I'm running. So here I am in my life and let's say even that I have a good job, a really good job that pays really well. So I pay my bills, I'm responsible, everything's fine. I have really, really good work ethics so nobody sees me as defective or you know nobody sees the other things that are going on i play it off really well and a lot of times we do that in addicts you'll see that sometimes where it's like they'll have a great job or they'll have something really great going on in their life but nobody sees them snorting cocaine in the bathroom 20 times in the night because they have such a good facade that everybody just sees that, oh look, he's got a good family and they all seem so happy. They go on vacations all the time and they have a really nice house. They must be happy. We don't see what's going on behind the scenes. And I'm here to tell you that there's a lot of things that happen behind the scenes that nobody's ever gonna tell you about. Even your best friend, even your sister, your brother, people that you think you know really well. There's a lot of things that we don't want people to find out and there's a lot of things that we don't even understand within ourselves that we feel that we're acting out. So when we don't acknowledge it, we rationalize it. We try to make it look prettier than it really is. That's very, very common. So I'm not here to judge anybody. It's not a criticism at all. It's when we start to understand that we're acting from the void space and what that even means, then we can go in and start becoming aware of what we're doing. And once we become aware of some of the behaviors that we're doing that aren't very good for us, that are self-destructive, for example, that are self-sabotaging, when we can start acknowledging that, then we can start saying, you know what, I need help. How do I hold myself accountable for doing all these things? You hold yourself accountable by feeling your feelings. Again, that still may not make sense, but I'm going to keep explaining things. So going back to me, now I'm the mom. So here I have a great job. All my coworkers love me. My boss loves me. And I'm never late and I never call off. I'm a great worker. But as soon as I clock out, I start drinking. I start partying every day. 
Even if I stay up all night, I still make it to work on time because that is the thing that I take pride in. That's something that actually makes me feel good about myself. That's this one piece of my life that I can control that makes me feel good and connected to me and that I'm good. And somehow it makes me a good person and that I'm enough because I have a, because I work really well. So I'm gonna keep up that facade. But on the side, here I am, I'm neglecting my son. I'm constantly choosing to go out with my friends instead of hanging out with him. And when I do hang out with him, it's he's actually exposed to me partying and being drunk all the time. So what does he get to see? He gets to see his mom drunk. He gets to see his mom in the void space constantly. Now, does he necessarily understand that mom doesn't feel good about herself? Maybe not logically, but guess what? Emotionally, he does. We may not understand things logically, but energetically, we understand it, which is why kids are really good at, like if they don't like somebody, for example, like if a little kid doesn't like who you're dating or if they don't like an adult that they're around, like a really little kid, their intuition is very high. They, they go based on how they feel in that moment. And they, if they don't like somebody, there's usually a really good reason for it. And I'm sure you guys have probably heard that before. It's because they know, they can feel somebody's energy. This person's fake, this person's doing something weird or I don't like it. They're not, they're not who they really say they are. So it's, we need to trust that. Kids know what they're talking about. But we still have that energy in us. We can still do that as adults. It's just we disconnect from that. Why? Because we start putting on the mask. We start... Uh, filling in the void space even more and creating more of a gap of disconnect so we're not as connected to that as we could be but it's there if we want to connect to it all of these things that I'm talking about consciousness feeling connecting to the feelings it's still within us it's just when it's out of our reach if I can't see it I can't see it to reach for it to really connect with it can I no, because we run from it, so we can't connect to it. It doesn't mean it's not there, and I think that's where the incongruency keeps coming in, and that's why a lot of times we'll feel so out of balance. So we have to go to more extremes to try to feel better, or I have to go to more extremes to try to feel okay with who I am, because I really don't, and I don't understand why I don't, because here I am doing all these things that should look good on paper, that other people should find desirable, like the good job, the nice house, the nice car, I got the family, you know, I got all these things, and am I lovable now? It's like, I don't know, do you believe that you're lovable because you have those things? Because none of those things makes us lovable. What makes us lovable is that I exist, that I matter, but I have to believe it. If I don't believe it, then I'm gonna to continue to go outside of myself to try to believe it. And really it's not me believing it when I do that. Really I'm trying to get other people to believe it. Because if you believe it, then maybe somehow it'll make sense and it'll be true. If you can see me as good, then maybe somehow I'll, I can see it and I'll believe it. That's really what we're doing. That's what that implies. Every time we keep going outside of ourselves, it may not seem that way, but that's what it means. So going back to the mother now, here my kids expose all these different things and I'm in complete denial, just drinking and thinking that everything's okay and that he's fine with everything that's going on because, hey, he's with his mom. We're spending time together, right? That's not quality time that you're spending with a kid when you're around adults and you're getting drunk. The kid's not getting anything from that. When you go and hang out with your child and you're doing something that they're wanting to do and you're talking with them in an honest way and you're just wanting to know things about them and just letting them be their authentic self, that's when you're spending quality time with your child, not when you're getting drunk and partying and having conversations with other people and letting your kid drink. That's not quality time going back to the video I made before I'm sitting on the couch and my kids sitting right next to me but we're both on our phones 
So we're not even talking to each other. We're totally disconnected. We're not even engaging. That's not quality time. Even if we do that as adults, if I'm sitting here with my husband and we're both on TikTok and we're not even talking to each other or looking at each other, that's not quality time. It's not. There's a difference. Do you want to connect with people on a deeper level or not? Oh, but guess what? If I can't connect to myself on a deeper level, then I can't connect to you on a deeper level. So here I am, the mom, and obviously I don't feel good about myself because I'm having to get drunk all the time. That's kind of an obvious one, I think. Going back to behavior implications. So here I'm getting drunk all the time. But not only that, it's I'm bringing my child with me because that makes me believe that I'm creating some kind of a bond and I'm not. I'm actually bringing trauma towards him because that can be very traumatic for a kid to be exposed to things like that. I was exposed to different things in a similar way. And I got to tell you, kids don't need to be around certain things. They do not. And it's not okay. And it does affect us later in life. It will. But so here I am, I'm like, no, I'm bonding with my kid. No, you're giving him your void space because you're giving him, I'm giving, I'm sorry, I'm the mom. I'm giving him me not feeling worthy about myself, me disconnected from my life and how I'm good. I'm giving him me not feeling good enough. I'm giving him me actually feeling defective because here I am having to do everything I can to try to feel normal. Look, but look, I have this really good job, so I am normal, and I am okay, and I'm fine, and nothing happened to me when I was little, and everything's okay, and life is great, and I'm just going to keep my same routine, and look, everything's fine. So let's take it a step further now. Me, the mother, drinking every day, okay. That already implies that there might be trauma that has happened in my childhood, although we don't want to admit it, and that's fine. That's always going to be your choice, whether you want to or not. But drinking, um, addictive cycles, that's one way in which we can cover up different things that have happened to us, different ways in which we have experienced trauma, and we don't want to look at it. We don't want to deal with it. What's the best way not to deal with something is to be completely zoned out and numb all the time completely disconnected when I'm drunk I'm not connected to myself when I'm drunk I'm not feeling authentic feelings although I know what some people are thinking when sometimes when we get drunk what happens we start getting all sad and we start thinking about things and we start spilling our guts talking about people that we like and just all of a sudden you know you start finding out all these things about people it's the whole the drunk talk or the drunk dial, you know, I'm going to call this person because I have liquid courage. None of those are authentic feelings. All of those are fear. That's us being in fear. That's me completely disconnected and, oh my gosh, I actually like this person and let me hurry up and call them only while I'm drunk because that's the only time I might kind of feel good about myself. And so if they reject me, it's going to be okay. It won't be as harsh because I'm drunk and I'm, I'm probably going to forget about it in the morning anyway. So really that's not us feeling or really going after something we want. That's really us trying to cushion the blow if we get rejected because nobody wants to get rejected. We fear rejection and abandonment by nature, I believe. So if anything is going to question not only how am I love, but now you're going to tell me no, or I don't like you, or I never liked you, oh no, that's going to make me feel even worse about myself. So we're not really connecting to actual emotions when we're drunk. I'm just using this as an example because I know we all have that friend or either we're that person where we just get real talkative when we start drinking. And you know what? Sometimes it's kind of... It's kind of nice, not in a healthy way, but I have been around people who drink and they get very soft and vulnerable how they know how to in the moment. And I'm like, oh, that's kind of nice to see that side of you, but that's not really you getting in touch with that yourself. That's you having to be disconnected from yourself and 
not really knowing what you're saying, even though you know what you're saying a little bit. Why can't you do that when you're sober? When you're sober and you can be vulnerable, that's when you're more connected. It's way different. So anyway, so let's take this a step further. I'm the mom. Go back to that. And a little part of my childhood is I was molested just once. Just once is all it takes. One time it will affect you for the rest of your life in a, I don't want to say negative way to scare you, but it will negatively impact how you see yourself for the rest of your life. Now, can we get better, do better, learn to feel our feelings and get through moments? Absolutely. Will it still affect me for the rest of my life? Absolutely. One time for one second will cause that to happen. I know people don't believe that or they think, ah, oh, it wasn't a big deal or I don't even really remember or I think it might have happened or it, it was so quick. Who cares? You did. Your energy cared. That's very traumatic for a child to have to deal with. That is very traumatic for a child to have to deal with. I know not everybody had that experience. That's just one example. But so let's say that that happened to me. So now here I am drinking every day. Why? Because I'm actually in so much pain. I don't even know how to deal with it. I feel so defective. I don't even know how to feel okay with myself. With that, whatever just happened when I was younger. How could somebody do something like that? So what am I going to do? I'm going to control everything in my life. I'm going to control all of my emotions by not feeling them. That's the only thing I can control and it makes me feel pretty good even though I'm actually really disconnected I feel safe so when we say we feel good a lot of times really what it is is that we feel safe because feeling safe does feel good it really does and we feel comfortable that always feels nice because we know exactly what to expect and so nothing's gonna come along and shatter my world. And that does feel nice, but that's not us feeling inner peace or inner joy. That's still us running and reaching for whatever, anything that feels okay, that's gonna make me feel some sense of normal or that's gonna make me feel anything pleasant so that it doesn't seem like I'm running for myself. So there's a difference. So I'm drinking, um, partying every day, bringing my kid into these situations and then not really talking to him outside of that because that's the only way I really know how to connect because I feel so horrible about myself that I don't even know how to really give myself to other people. And not only that, but like I said, I'm going to create a lot of drama. I'm, I love drama. I want to hear everybody's drama. If somebody needs help, I'm going to go rescue them, but then I'm going to keep talking shit about them and I'm going to lie to everybody and always have some excuse for why I'm doing whatever it is that I'm doing. And I'm going to go and be not angry, but just, you know, I'm just going to say a lot of really mean, nasty things about people because that somehow makes me feel better. Do I realize that I'm doing that? No. Am I going to admit that I drink because I don't feel good about myself? No, I'm just going to say I like to party. That's what we all say. So what do you think? Now, here's my story as the mom. And I'm covering up trying not to feel defective because you cannot be sexually abused and not feel defective to some degree. I don't believe so. I believe that's one of the indirect messages we're always going to hear. What's wrong with you? Are you deformed? Is there something wrong with you? Ew, you're gross. I'm disgusting. Ew, how could somebody do something like that? Because how does it feel? It feels disgusting, which means what? It means I felt like I was disgusting. That's so normal. That's so normal. So the void space is I'm not going to get close to anybody because I think I'm disgusting. I'm going to go and drink instead. And all my relationships are going to be with other people who like to drink also. Why? So that neither one of us are ever really telling our truth, speaking our truth, or connecting on a real level. 
so I can continue this facade, the other person I'm with is going to have a facade. Like energy attracts like energy. So I don't ever have to think about myself as effective. But now whoever I marry or get with, as somebody who's trying to hide that, I'm probably going to go now and do everything for this person. I'm going to go and cook you all your meals and I'm going to make sure that I'm the best wife ever. And even though I'm still neglecting my 13 year old son, but now here my husband, I'm great to this guy. Now, who I, let's say I just met somebody and we got married. I'm going to cook for you, clean for you. I'm going to lay out your clothes for work. And when you get home, I'm going to be like, oh my gosh, like, I'm so happy to see you. Here's your dinner. And here's a beer because I know you like to drink also like energy attracts like energy. It's not always that obvious though. An alcoholic wants to be with an alcoholic. It's not always that obvious at all. It could be the complete opposite. Somebody's an alcoholic, but then they get with somebody who's very unsocial and doesn't want to ever interact with anybody. Somebody who kind of stays quiet, but they kind of do their own thing. Because that person maybe doesn't feel good about who they are, but that's kind of how they stay in their void space is by just staying quiet and not hanging out with anybody. So, I mean, there's a lot of different things that we can start to do to act out us not feeling good about who we are. It doesn't, it's not always going to be obvious, which is why I think a lot of people don't see it in themselves. And what it makes it easier for us to deny it. Look, I have a good job. I'm fine. I have a great family. I'm fine. Like, look, I, I go on vacation all the time. I'm fine. It's like, okay. It's only when you want to admit different things or it's what you want from your life. Really, really is what it is. So now here I am. I have my 13 year old kid and I'm going and partying, but then I got married and now I'm doing everything for my husband and he's also an alcoholic. But we have the greatest relationship because you know what? He tells me I'm special and he tells me he loves me every day. I was like, that's great. But there's a big difference between somebody saying it and somebody being in their love space and they're actually able to connect with you in that space. I talked about that in the last video. If I'm giving you my void space, I'm not giving you love. I'm giving you my fear. I'm giving you all of my insecurities. I'm giving you all of the trauma. I'm giving you all of the self-doubt. I'm giving you the self-sabotage. I'm giving you all of those things. I'm giving you me running. But you're thinking, wait, but I'm still receiving this. So you're not running from me. You're right. I'm running from myself because I'm choosing to only give you my void space because that's all I've given myself. So if I don't give myself love, if I don't know how to fill in my own void with how I am good and how I am enough, I'm going to just continue to give everybody how I don't believe that I'm good enough. And that doesn't look like depression. That doesn't always look like something mean and negative or nasty. It can look really pleasant. Look, I cooked all your favorite meals. Do you love me now? Am I good now? Do I matter now? Is it okay to cook for our spouses? Of course it is. That's not what I mean. Even when I talk about the people pleasing in codependency, there's a difference between me wanting to do something for you because I have time to do it or you need help and you know, I can help you. That's fine. There's a big difference between that and me feeling this need to help people and do everything I can for everybody because I need them to approve of me. There's a big difference. Do we want to admit that we're doing things because we're seeking approval? No, we have to look at behavior implications. How often are you helping people? Are you helping people and then talking shit because it's stressing you out? Are you overextending yourself? Are you doing it so much, so consistently and constantly that you're not even giving yourself a break? Those are signs of codependency. Healthy boundaries are, you know what? I need to do things for me first of all, because I need to be in a good place with myself. But if I can help somebody out, great. However you're going to react, it's not going to shatter my world. That's another thing. We do things and we wait for somebody's reaction. Are you going to approve of me? Are you going to think positively? Are you going to say something positive so that I can feel good? 
because then that's going to make me feel good. If that makes me feel good, fake good, then that means I am good. But that's not mindful emotions. That was somebody else doing something and you reacted to it or you did something and somebody else reacted to it. So it made you feel some sense of purpose in that moment. You weren't purposeful because you went in and gave that to yourself. You only felt that because somebody else did it for you. And we can't rely on other people to keep doing that for us. That's not even other people's job. Because if I have to go out of my way to try to get everybody else to do it, to try to make me feel like I'm enough, to try to make me feel like I matter, it's I'm always running from me actually believing that within myself, technically, because I keep trying to show it to you and I keep trying to hand you my void space so that you will react a certain way so that I can feel okay. And that's not anybody else's job. That's not me really feeling good about myself. That's me in fear. That's me not feeling good about myself. That's me running. And so as I'm running, I'm running to you saying, here, you somehow make me feel like I'm okay. Can you somehow say something nice so that I can feel good for a little bit? Can you give me a compliment? Can you sit here and talk shit with me so that I feel justified in what I'm saying and that I'm angry and that I'm saying all these nasty things? And if you agree with me, then good. I'm not being mean and I'm not doing it to run for myself. I'm, I'm doing it and it's okay because you think it's okay. We do things like that all the time. It's about recognizing all of these things. And at what point do you want better for yourself? Or do you think your life's already great? It's always going to be up to you and what you want. And do you think you're happy? And if you do, then keep doing whatever you're doing. I know I wasn't happy. And I can relate to a lot of these scenarios. Not Maybe not exactly the same thing, but I know what it's like to hand everybody my void space. So now again, here I am, the mom, I was sexually abused and drinking, exposing my 13 year old son to all this. And my husband, now that I'm married to, he also likes to drink with me. We keep it at the surface and I do everything for him. And I think we have the greatest relationship in the world, even though we never connect on a deep level. But you know what? That makes me feel safe. So I think it's a great relationship. If I'm not happy with who I am, I'm totally fine with being with somebody else who's not happy with they are. With I'm sorry, with who they are. Why? Because like energy attracts like energy. If you're not happy with yourself, that actually makes me feel better about me not being happy with myself. Because if we're two people that are together and we're sitting here giving each other our void space, that gives us some fake sense of connection technically. So do I ever see it as depressing or sad? No, I actually think that that's pretty bonding. And here I am connecting with this person. It's like, you're not connecting with that person. You're getting their void space. Here, I'm giving you my emptiness. I'm giving you my darkness. I'm giving you how I don't like myself. And here, I'm giving you my insecurities. Here, I'm handing you how I never thought highly of myself. And here, all I want to do is drink every day and be completely disconnected from life. Here you go. I'm handing that to you. Oh, you do the same thing. Oh, okay, then we're in love. And if that's what you want, keep doing it. A lot of people do that. That's kind of an extreme example, but it's really not. A lot of people are in situations like that or marriages like that. So now where's my son? Oh yeah, what about him? Well, I found a guy that, you know, pays attention to me and that makes me feel really good. So now I'm really not paying attention to my kids. So he's kind of over off to the side. Like, you know, he's still there. He's living with us, but we will interact with him when we're not super drunk. We'll take him to a baseball game or something, or we'll do something fun with him every now and again, maybe on the weekends, but regularly during the week or just 
consistently, what are we giving him? We're giving him our void space. So what do you think is going to happen to the 13 year old? A lot of different things can start to happen. He could start getting bad grades in school. He could stop going to school, start ditching, start running with the wrong crowd, join a gang. Or he can do the complete opposite because that's what we think. That's the obvious thing, right? Or he can start drinking, doing experimenting with drugs. That would be the obvious thing. And that happens a lot. And then when that happens and then the here me as the mom, the school is calling me up. Hey, your kid came to school drunk. And I'm just like, what? And then I get mad at him. How dare you? How could you do this? It's like, wait a second, mom. But you're the one that always brings me around you and your drunk friends. And now you're mad at me for being drunk. It's like, yeah, because I'm an adult. You're not allowed to do that. Now, all of a sudden, here I am not taking responsibility for creating this cycle. And now all of a sudden he's having issues and struggling. And now all of a sudden it's his fault. How dare you? Let me call your dad. Your dad's going to deal with this. I don't want to deal with this because I'm a great mom and I have a great job. And now I'm married and my life's great. And I don't understand how you're sitting here doing all these things and getting into trouble. So I'm going to call your dad. I'm going to let him deal with it. Because it's not my fault. I didn't hand you my void space all those years. It's not my fault that you're disconnected and that you're doing things. No. Why? Because if I admit that he's doing that because of something that I did, what do I then have to admit? Not only that I may have done something wrong, or maybe that I think that I failed as a parent or whatever. It's when we go deeper than that, I think why we don't like to admit things that we're doing. Because subconsciously, a lot of this is on the subconscious level. I'm going to keep saying that subconsciously I'm doing all of these things because why I don't feel good about myself not only that though I don't understand how I'm loved so how do I even matter how do I even exist I don't want to go into that because then I start to disappear and I don't know how I'm loved so I don't as human beings we shut that down right away I don't want to understand how I believe that I'm not loved I don't want to connect to that I want to believe that I am loved by getting everybody else and everything else to fill my void and then I'll feel some sense of purpose. So that helps us feel okay temporarily, even though that's not really us believing that we're loved. That's us continuing to believe that we're not because we continue to hand other people our void space. But so if I sit there as the mom and I really start thinking about stuff, and I'm like, this isn't good and what did I do wrong and wait why am I drinking every day why was I exposing him to all those situations why wasn't I really trying to spend more time with him oh because then he would see me because when we start to spend time with people and we're trying to be more authentic and we're trying to connect deeper and deeper what's going to start happening people are going to start finding out things about us you have no idea how much we try to avoid people learning certain things about us. We don't want people to know because now you know things and now you might start to look at me a certain way. And that's going to make me feel even worse about myself. So I'm hiding it. I'm going to keep hiding it. And I'm going to go to extremes to hide it. It's the mask. It's the mask that as far as I'm concerned as human beings we all wear at some point. Until we become comfortable with us and who we are and what we've been through. And to really make the connection that, you know what, I was still loved. Even though all of those things were happening to me. Very hard to do that. That's what this process, the flow of emotions, is all about bringing that back into balance. But if I'm not in balance, then going back to the hear me as the mom. I don't want to admit anything. And I definitely don't want to start thinking about the abuse because then I have to start thinking about how that actually did make me feel and who would do that to somebody and how defective I actually feel because of it. And if I start making that connection, I'm going to start feeling so depressed. I'm going to get into that dark pit of despair so far deep because I don't know how to even understand how I'm loved when all of those things were happening to me.
So I'm going to keep wearing the mask. I'm going to stay in the void space. I'm going to try to justify how great the void space is and rationalize it and give it to other people. Because it's a lot easier for me to do that than for me to get sucked into the void space. And all of a sudden, it's up to me to believe that I'm love. And then all of a sudden, I have to be strong and I have to start loving who I am. And I have to start seeing myself as valuable. I don't know how to do that. I'd rather just hand it to you and make you do it. Because in order for me to do that, I have to feel the defectiveness. I have to actually physically go back and feel the shame, feel not good enough, feel the unworthiness. I have to go back and feel like I don't matter. And I, if I do that, I start to shrink and who am I? And all of a sudden I'm so disconnected and it's such a scary feeling that we won't allow ourselves to go there. And I'm here to tell you that part of this process is what I said last time when we do start to really connect to these things and how we are really feeling about ourselves and really going there. The reason why it's so scary at first is because we do start to disappear. We do. Because the old us that was an ego that was doing everything impressive to try to please other people, to try to show other people that, hey, look, my life's great and everything's fine. You start taking all that away. You start unpacking your emotional baggage. You start looking at stuff that it never feels good to do that. It doesn't, it doesn't feel good to think, oh man, all these things that were happening, even just in my human experience, has actually impacted me negatively in some way. How I attach to people, the kinds of relationships I'm going to choose to be in, where I'm going to work, how good of a worker I'm even going to be, just how I'm going to live my life in general. Am I going to let people in? Am I going to keep running? Am I going to just keep bonding with other people who are in their void space? Because if that's where we're at, that's where we're going to be at with other people. So... None of this is pleasant for us to feel. And it's so hard to go in. And then now how do I even believe I'm love in this pit of despair, in this hopeless, dark tunnel? How am I still love? We have to start giving that to ourselves. It's not easy to do this process. It's not easy. It's not just about, okay, I need to stop drinking. It's not, okay, I am... Um, I need to stop bringing my son around my friends and I need to stop drinking in front of him. You don't just stop doing something like that. You don't just stop an addictive cycle that you've been doing for years and years because you say so. You're doing it because you're emotionally wounded and hurt. So in order for the cycle that you've created because of that behavior implications, the void space, to really get through that cycle and break it, I have to go back in and understand that I'm not feeling good about myself and I have to start feeling better about myself. But that's not because I just go in and say so. You know what? I'm going to choose to feel good today. No, it's not the way it works. It's not the way trauma works. It's I need to go in and feel all these unpleasant feelings. If it still doesn't make sense to you, I get it. It's, it's really... it. Almost doesn't make sense why we have to feel all the unpleasant, painful things in order to start feeling better. But if you look at it as, if I'm running from myself because I think that a part of me is ugly, it's just, it's defective, it's not enough. So I don't want to look at it. I don't want to feel that. When I run and I'm going into the void space and I'm self-sabotaging and I'm disconnecting I'm drinking I'm talking shit I'm codependent I'm all these things I'm doing because I don't want to look at myself it implies that there's a part of me that I think is really gross and every time I run from it it's like I'm believing that a part of me is really defective and that that part of me is not enough that's the implication when we keep running from ourselves and we don't want to deal with these things. When we stay in the void space, it implies that I want to stay disconnected. I don't want to look at this because this part of me isn't enough. So I don't want to look at it. 
this pain, this trauma, whatever happened, all of these things, I don't want to look at it because in that space, energetically, I wasn't feeling good enough. I wasn't feeling like I mattered. I didn't believe that I was loved. So if I look at that and I go in and start feeling that and really feeling into it, then we think that we're believing that we're not loved and that's not true. And here's why, because first of all, if I'm running from me, that implies that there's something scary about me that I'm trying to get away from. But guess what? I can't really run away from myself. I can drink every day and do drugs and do so many things to distract myself from feeling horrible. But I'm still me at the end of the day, who I go to bed with and who I wake up with is me. Always. It's you. You do that for you. I do that with me. So we don't really run from ourselves, actually. We put distance between how I didn't feel loved and how I didn't believe that I was lovable. And we start running. We start grabbing the crutch. We reach for the crutch. Anything that's going to give us some sense of safety or comfort. That's going to look like a lot of different things. I'm going to go work for 20 hours because I don't have to be with myself alone in my thoughts, really here with me in my present moment. If I'm busy, I'm going to stay busy. I'm going to run a bunch of errands. I'm just going to go do a bunch of things that I don't even really need to be doing. But hey, it helps distract me. I'm going to go shopping. Lots of different things we can do. Lots of different things we can do. Where we're actually running from us. And running for me implies that there's something that I need to run from because it's not enough. That's what that implies. So that's what we start to believe. So if I'm actually, a part of me is believing that I'm not enough, what do you think I'm going to do? That's why I'm running to you so that I can do things for you so that you can actually tell me that I'm enough by being nice to me, by marrying me, by staying with me, by buying me things, by talking shit with me, all these things. So all of a sudden, hey, I am enough because look, this person's reciprocating that I'm enough. And really all they're reciprocating is your void space. Do you think that's a real bond when you're sitting there just and two people are talking shit with each other? No. How are you connecting? You're connecting through running. You're connecting through being mean, technically. You're connecting through you not wanting to see yourself. So you're talking shit about somebody else and you found somebody else to do that with. That's not a connection in love. That's a connection in the void space. So how do we bring that back to us? Once again, it's because it's going to be me and I'm going to choose to stop running from myself. I'm going to admit that I've been running from myself my whole life. I'm going to finally admit that, you know what, maybe I have been distracting myself. Maybe I have been wearing a mask. Maybe I have been hiding a little bit. So how do I not hide anymore? It takes accountability, first of all. You have to really want this process. You have to really want to do this and accept that it's going to be extremely painful and that you're going to see and experience things that are not going to feel good. Because every time I go in now and I choose not to run, I choose to feel defective, which still may not make sense. Just because I'm feeling it doesn't mean that I am defective. What it means is that something happened. It made me feel defective. It did. And now that I get to go in and feel that and sit with myself and experience me and my energy in that moment and be in my present self, my present moment, Every time I do that, what am I doing? I'm spending the most authentic time and space with me that I can. That's my energy. I'm connecting to it. I'm sitting there. I'm not going to go reach for the drink. I'm going to sit there with me and I'm going to feel all of these uncomfortable feelings because that's what I've been running from this whole time. Not the physical me. I've been running from the energetic me that didn't feel good about herself. I've been running from the energetic person who, sorry, it's really hot. <laughs> I've been running from the energetic person who continues to feel shame. 
So now when I sit with this person, instead of running, when I sit with her and it's like, you know what, let me really, let me get to know you. You feel defective? That's okay. I understand why. Let's feel that together. And you go in there and you start creating that relationship with yourself, your energy, so to speak. Not only are you saying I'm good, it's I'm love because I'm worth this process. I'm love because... Look, I'm choosing to look at me, all of me. I'm not running anymore. I'm sitting here and I'm choosing to feel all these things that I've really been running from my whole life and not realizing. That's the most you can love yourself as far as I'm concerned. That's the most in your present self. I am here. I am love that I can be is when I feel all of my authentic feelings. And I know you're like, well, I don't want to feel the bad negative feelings then you're not going to feel the positive ones either and i know again what you're thinking i feel positive things all the time i'm yeah as a reaction to something that happened or as a reaction to someone else when we start to feel our feelings we don't feel necessarily just good things it's that i I feel okay with who I am finally, and that's the best feeling in the world. I feel this sense of inner peace and calm, and it's such a good feeling because I'm not constantly exhausted running wearing the mask. I'm here, and I'm okay, and I believe that I'm loved, and I'm in my space where I can just sit and believe that, and that creates inner joy also. But that's balance. Why? Why do we have to feel the unpleasant, nasty, negative things that don't feel good? Because when we don't feel them, we create the void space and we give it away. And we start doing things that are so bad for us. We start making the worst decisions. We don't realize it. We're connecting to everybody and everything in life through a void space. When we keep it, we hold on to it. When we choose it instead of love, we're choosing fear. I'm choosing to continue to run away from how I actually believe I'm love by getting you to tell me that I'm love instead. Do we realize we're doing this once again? No. This is why I keep giving you examples. You may not fit these scenarios once again, but it's you have to fit it for you. We all do something at some point. When we bring it back to us and really learn to feel our feelings. We're not running anymore. We're saying I'm enough because I'm here and I'm choosing me. I'm enough. I'm love. So I'm not going to be questioning how I'm love when I'm sitting here giving myself love by sitting here and feeling everything I need to feel. It's really hard to do that, which is why to me that's self, as much self-love as we can get into. And that's us filling in our own void. That's me finally believing that I'm good. So I don't need to create all these circumstances to try to pretend like I do by getting other people to react so that I can react, so that we're all just reacting. I don't want to react. I want to actually feel. And I want to be in control of that because that's healthy control. That's me doing it for me. And nobody can take that away from you. If I'm reliant on you to make me feel good about myself, you can take that away from me because the minute we stop talking, guess what? You're not there to do that for me anymore. But guess what? When I learn to do that for myself, nobody can take that away from me because I am me and I am love, your love. We don't always believe it. So all these situations we might be getting ourselves into, we just got to think about it. That was kind of an extreme example, but you know, I want to say real quick as the mom, here my kid is, I'm saying he's in trouble, he's getting into trouble a lot. That's not always the case though. He could grow up and all of a sudden get married and have kids and have a good job himself. But if he didn't understand and learn how he's loved and learned to fill in his void, we might see that and think, oh, he turned out well. But Maybe he doesn't experience intimacy with his wife, for example, because he doesn't know how to connect on a deeper level. So he actually always keeps her at an arm's distance. Or maybe he tries to be a perfectionist or the people pleaser. I'm going to do everything I can to make sure that everybody else is happy. 
or you know what, I'm gonna go and have this great job, but I'm gonna be away from home a lot because I wanna distract myself and stay busy. We don't see that as much of a void space as somebody who's drinking and getting into trouble and joining gangs, for example. But you know what? When we start looking at things as those are all a way in which we're disconnected and just avoiding how we're loved, you're gonna just start to see everything as Am I valuing myself right now or am I not? Am I running from myself? So whatever examples I give you or that I even see in other people or even in myself, it's we're running. However, we're going to do it to whatever extreme measures we're going to do that. Even if it seems something so simple or something so extreme, like oh, I'm going to join a gang or I'm going to go and do cocaine every day versus oh well, i'm just gonna have ocd for example i'm gonna be a hoarder because i'm a compulsive shopper because that helps me feel okay it helps me feel in control of myself and my emotions i know all about that it's still a way in which we're trying to control how we feel by not feeling so we're still going outside of ourselves to try to control that instead of learning how to feel and be in the flow of emotions so whether it was a gang that i joined to try to feel some sense of belonging, to just try to establish how I'm loved, or here I am washing my hands compulsively, which I used to do when I was younger, until they bleed, because I'm trying to understand how I'm loved, because I'm trying to distract myself, because I don't want to feel the void space, I, even though I'm there. It's all just a way in which we're running, really. It's just how extreme are we gonna go, and you know, every we each have a do have a different personality. We do have a different upbringing. We all have a different temperament, even that we're born with. So we're all gonna go a different direction. But it's the point is that whatever direction we're going, we're still running from ourselves until we learn to not run from ourselves. So again, it's very hard to see it. It's very hard to not want to run. It's very hard to sit with ourselves and sit in that pain and sit in that darkness and sit and be with our truth and learn to feel okay with that. It's really hard to do it. But let's keep going because it's possible and the more you do it, the better you do start to feel. It takes a long time. But the more I feel my feelings, the more I'm in my authentic flow of emotions, the more I do believe that I'm loved. And so guess what? I'm not going to keep running. Instead, I'm going to actually try to make better relationships and because I feel better about myself. And so I feel more capable of doing better for myself because that's the energy that I'm at now. And so that's the energy I'm going to continue to attract is me being more stable, me being around people that are more stable, not dating crackheads, for example. So all of these things, let's just keep thinking about it. And how do you run and what are the crutches that you reach for? You have to be honest about that. Are you connecting through your void space or are you connecting through love? It's always going to be your choice. Let's just keep talking about it.